1893, Lewis Carroll wrote a book called Sylvie and Bruno Concluded. In all respects, it was just as absurd as Alice in Wonderland, though it was some 28 years after Alice had been published. In chapter 11, the character of Mein Herr is telling another character about his country's love of map making. He says to the man, in my country, we started making maps at a scale of six inches to the mile. So for you non-map people out there, that means six inches on the paper equals a mile in the real world. But they wanted better. So they made a map at the scale of six yards to the mile, and then 600 yards to the mile. Can you see where this is going? Then they had the grand idea. They would make a map on the scale of a mile to the mile. Have you used it much? inquires the main character. Oh, it has never been spread out yet, says Mein Herr. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the country and block out the sunlight. I love this story because for people like me who have spent their career in the geomatics and mapping industry, the idea of a better map has always meant a more accurate map. And yet, the notion of a one-to-one -one map is completely absurd. For most of human history, the maps that we create reflect the world around us. And the cartographers that made the maps have held all the power. As our understanding of the world filled in and expanded, so did our maps. Our understanding of the world changed our maps. This is the map that Columbus had when he sailed for the so-called New World, and it's remarkably good for its time. And now, in the era of GPS and mobile phones and high-speed internet, the power to create and utilize maps is shifting. Now, maps are beginning to change the way that we see the world. In this talk, I'm going to change the way you think about maps, and maybe even the world around you. Let's go way back way back past Lewis Carroll to the invention of hard copy and the earliest known map called the Imago Mundi. It's dated to the 6th century BCE and depicts Babylon on the Euphrates River. You can see it features a circular landmass surrounded by Oceanus, the personification of the world ocean in Greek myth. Now, to most people, this doesn't look like much and it's difficult to see how it represents the world. But for the cartographer that made it, the Imago Mundi would have represented the entire available world as he knew it. This map was centered on him and the world in which he lived. Historically, the hardest part about creating a map has always been collecting the data. You would need to physically go somewhere, measure the terrain accurately, and then write it down on some kind of medium. This often involved vast and complex journeys by land or ocean, or perhaps the painstaking gathering of information from other travelers. And then, depending on the winds and the currents or your ability, your map could be different from somebody else's. An objective truth was hard to come by. Then, once you finished the map, it was difficult to reproduce or share. After all, if I give you my stone tablet, I don't have it anymore from which to make another copy. Map making was a domain of experts, elites, and specialists. And for a long time, nothing really changed. I mean, the maps got better and more detailed, and we filled in all the blank spaces, but someone still had to go somewhere and measure something. Then on December 7th, 1972, the Apollo 17 crew snapped the famous blue marble photo. It wasn't our first view of the world from space, but it was the one that changed our view of the world. In the 48 years since that photo was taken, the world of mapping has moved at a lightning pace. Today, we have GPS chips that run on watch batteries and are smaller than a fingernail. We have satellites that can image the entire landmass of the Earth every single day. And each of us carries around a GPS-enabled camera slash pocket computer with more power than all of the Apollo 17 mission. It's one small step for tech, one giant leap for mapping. Today, we can effortlessly collect location data and make maps in ways the maker of the Imago Mundi 
could have only dreamed. In fact, I believe we're on the cusp of radical change in the way that location data is being used. The maps that I've shown so far all have one thing in common. They all reflect the world of the cartographer that made it. In some cases, this means the geography itself is twisted or misaligned, as with the Columbus map I showed earlier. And in other cases, it shows the social constructs and biases that exist in our world. Today, the map that we as North Americans are most familiar with is this one, with the Americas on the left and Asia on the right. And while it might feel awkward or uncomfortable, this polar projection map is just a real representation of the Earth as the previous one. In the Lewis Carroll story I told, the concept of a one-to-one -one map is absurd because the only medium in which they had to roll out that map was hard copy. But in the 21st century, we have computers, and augmented reality, and we have the ability to roll out a one-to-one -one scale map digitally. And in the world of the one-to-one -one scale map, the bias of the cartographer takes on a lesser role, as we each can contribute and consume maps with bespoke data. In fact, one-to-one -one scale maps already exist. As so-called digital twins, they are becoming more and more common in large industrial facilities. Created using modern laser scanning and digital imaging techniques, we have the ability to create perfect digital maps of large spaces. These one-to-one -one scale maps are used for modeling equipment ahead of repairs and ensure that manufactured parts will fit properly within the existing infrastructure. Using a one-to-one -one map in this context saves time and cost for the facilities managers and equipment suppliers. When facility shutdowns can cost millions of dollars per hour, a one-to-one -one map can make all the difference. For the cathedral in Notre Dame, a one-to-one -one map will be critical in the efforts for rebuilding. We all remember that terrible fire from the spring of 2017 that destroyed a large part of the 800-year-old landmark. Fortunately, the late art historian Andrew Tallon had been using state-of-the-art laser scanning equipment to map every nook and cranny of the interior space. In the end, he and his team collected over a billion points of data from more than 50 interior locations. And as they begin to think about rebuilding this iconic landmark, I'm certain the one-to-one -one map will be invaluable. But let's go beyond industrial facilities and architecture and imagine how this could roll out in our personal lives and our civic spaces. Imagine a world where you can inhabit the map and wear it around you like a cloak. You can intimately understand the physical locations through which you're traveling. And you can have a strong connection to place and history. This connection to the past gives us a foundation on which to build the future. Using data collected from everyone's devices in an ethical and transparent way, we can abstract up from the movement of an individual to the movement of a population. This allows us to begin to infer and understand the reasons and uses of our public spaces. And this sort of data can lead to improved public policy and land use decisions and the design of our civic spaces. In the era of hard copy from 600 BCE to yesterday, we made physical maps focused on physical attributes, coastlines, hills, canyons. But in the era of the one-to-one -one scale map, we can begin to map out the non-physical, the psychosocial and sociological aspects of our, of our world. These things speak to why people are in the spaces and what it means to them. Let's look at an example. Here's the Glenmore Reservoir area uh, here in Calgary. It looks like you'd expect with delineations for water, grass, roads, buildings. But let's take a look at this in a popular activity tracking application. When with this view, we can see the areas popular with cyclists and runners and walkers, as evidenced by those bright lines around the perimeter of the reservoir. This is an obvious extrapolation from the, the physical entity, from the physical map. But the social layer shows us information that's not obvious. This racetrack-shaped oval in the middle of the reservoir tells us the park is also popular with rowers. This is something we can't extrapolate from the physical map. These maps are interesting for another reason, and that is that the priorities of the makers and the users is baked right into the design. In that first map, the dominant feature was roads, and in the second map, the dominant feature is trails and pathways. 
The first map was built to the scale of the automobile, and the second map to the scale of the individual. Both are equally accurate, both represent the physical world as it is, and importantly, each map reflects that which is most valued by their users. In the world of the one-to-one -one map, the map can begin to reflect our values and priorities. As we move into this new era, it leaves us with a few questions yet to be resolved. Questions like, who owns the data? And what are the consequences of that choice? How do we respect everyone's privacy and ensure equal access? Should government or private industry build and maintain it? And importantly, do we risk creating a system that helps people see the world as they wish versus the world as it actually is? In the digital era, the tools to map our world are readily available and accessible to all, and we each have the power to contribute to the emerging one-to-one -one map. You're probably doing it already without even realizing it. The device you carry, it's constantly collecting information about where you go and the spaces you use and how you use them. You can choose to contribute more consciously through projects like OpenStreetMap, the so-called Wikipedia of geographic information. In the era of the one-to-one -one map, we have the means to collect the data, construct the map, and roll it out to everyone without blocking out the sun. Thank you.